Hi, my name is Heather, and I'll be one of the presenters for session F3, Establishing Systems for Policy and Evaluation. We're going to give people a couple of minutes to get settled and make sure they've got all of the technological aspects worked out or to get a cup of tea, whatever you need. We'll get started here in a few minutes. In the meantime, I'm going to roll the slides with the expectations for the forum and how to get help if you need it, how to access polls, etc. If you don't need that reminder, again, you can ignore it. And when the music fades out, you'll know we're getting ready to start content. Thank you and see you in a few. Session F3, Establishing Systems for Evaluation and Policy. My name is Heather Hatton, and I am an assistant research professor at the University of Missouri. I'll be presenting with Leslie and Danielle, and I'll let them introduce themselves as they start the pieces of the presentation that they're giving today. Um, as we walk through today's work, our objectives are to look at a very similar process from two different districts. So the walk that they're taking is through the evaluation part of the DSFI and through setting up and establishing all of their evaluation systems, data, and practices for the evaluation process. Once we've compared and contrasted those two processes, we're going to look at the connections between the evaluation part of the DSFI and the policy part of the DSFI. Those two areas in the DSFI are very content heavy and it seems like it's sort of a an extensive to-do list but there's a lot of crossover back and forth and so we'll spend a little bit of time talking about how to take what you see from what independent school district and omaha public schools are doing and walk that through as you look at the policy and evaluation pieces of the dsfi we've got a few guiding questions for you I want you to be able at the end of the day to have discussions with your team about how do you identify and prioritize district level implementation activities and how are you using data to do that and what data might you still need. Also thinking about how you're going to think about policy and here I'm not just talking about office discipline referral policy or, or code of conduct policy, but all of the policies that are involved in keeping a district running to make those policies supportive of PBIS. And then finally, I want you to think a little bit about how, how to start doing an annual policy review 
and how that connects with your yearly evaluation plan and report. Again, there's lots of crossover between these two areas in the DSFI. We're going to start in the evaluation area, like I said, and both Leslie and Danielle have identified for me that they really think that the work that they're doing focuses on these five items from the DSFI. So thinking about how do we collect data? When do we collect data? What data do we collect? And then how do we use it? How do we use it to support buildings? How do we use it to support students? How do we use it to support teachers? And then also, how do we use it to acknowledge that we're making the progress we wanted to make? And what's really interesting about both of these school districts is the way that they're developing their internal capacity to handle their own evaluation. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Leslie. I would like to welcome Leslie to the session today. Leslie, if you would please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about Independent School District. Sure. Well, I am uh, Leslie Hawksprung. I'm the assistant superintendent for elementary instruction this year, uh, but spent the past 13 years as a building principal. And so my perspective today will be to share with you um, from a building level and also from a district level. Our uh, demographics are listed there for you. We have uh, about 15,000 students at this point, and uh, the grade makeups are there for you as well. We are a pre-K to K uh, district and um, focus our PBIS initiatives on all of those levels. So Leslie, tell us a little bit about the, the work that you're doing in independence, particularly around database decision making and the needs that you all saw for systematizing database decision making. Well, I think I could start by just giving you a little background about how we got to where we are. We started about 10 years ago with one building adopting PBIS and uh, being a sole implementer. Uh, we saw um, positive outcomes from that, as well as the research that we had done. Uh, we were primarily a BIST school district at that point and uh, decided at, at, at about year 2013 to start to look at a district-wide implementation so that we could have um, a district-wide look at our data and be able to um, implement and support the implementation of what's going on in all of the buildings. So over the next three years, all of the buildings um, were fully uh, into a tier one uh, year of training. And then over the next um, several years, we uh, saw a need really to be um, take, taking a look at how as a district we could provide the training. Uh, once we had 30 buildings on board, at some point it becomes really difficult to have um, all of the people out of the building at the same time for training. And so we were looking at how to streamline that, give each building the training they needed at their level and at that time that they needed it. So you can see in year 17, 18 that our um, school psychology just really began to request more um, of a role in this and we used sort of the train the trainer um, model and then um, the district leadership team started meeting regularly the next year and at that point we were able to really take a look at um, specific needs in buildings and tailor the training to what they needed at, depending on what tier it was, or specifically um, just needs of that staff. And so that brings us up to today where we're talking about um, really um, taking a look at where we've come from our data collection uh, model and how we look at the data district wide, and then also how we can um, that data, what it tells us about policy at the district level and um, and our next steps for for our district. So Leslie, you've you've told us a little bit about what independence school district needed in terms of database decision making and the the processes that you knew you wanted to develop. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you did and how you address those concerns? Sure. 
Well, when we got started, um, we knew that one barrier was that we did not have a common uh, behavior data, data tracking system across all of the buildings. And so then that, you know, the problem with that was we could not compare information, we could not dig deeper into um, what we needed to find out. And so we, um, our tech department here took the information that is required by um, PBIS and all that big five data, and we were able to include that. But we were also able to include um, information about demographics, about how um, adults respond to behavior. And um, this allowed us to then have information that was uh, helpful with compliance and uh, to state reporting or things like that. But then also that uh, we could incorporate that language that we expected to see in um, adults into our policies um, when we were um, looking at seclusion and restraint. So that um, we call it incident tracker and it, um, it's what we have used for several years and allows us to be able to look at the same information in all buildings. We also knew that we needed uh, to gather other kinds of information. And so we uh, use our PBIS app surveys. We look at uh, the windows that we set at a district level and um, have implemented um, timelines for our district team to be looking at that information as well as buildings. We also have an in-house um, survey that is run through our problem solving team process. And that survey um, asks that, that the the buildings give lots of information, not only about PBIS, but all of our MTSS practices. And that allows then our school psychs who are very tied to the problem solving process to be able to tailor um, the PD offerings for buildings to the needs that we find in that survey as well. We also take it maybe one step further in looking at the um, fidelity of the use or implementation of PBIS. And um, one way that we do that is through the school improvement process. So um, in the fall, um, building teams will fill out the PBIS scorecard and that, um, that gives them information then uh, one for the uh, building wide scorecard for the school improvement plan presentation. And then also so that they know it's very tied into the um, PD offerings. So when they rank themselves in certain aspects of PBIS implementation, it's very simple to see as a building leader, um, these were the missing pieces when we ranked ourselves. And so those are the PD that we need to be offering this year. Um, we get, um, you know, a lot of good information from that process. So that will help us know um, how to support buildings, but also it's even tied into the um, principal evaluation process, that school improvement uh, card. And then um, we, we knew that we needed to be looking at um, our fidelity um, in person. So it's one thing to be looking at you know, numbers and another to look at a survey of, you know, sort of anecdotal information. But we felt like we were at the point then that we wanted to have opportunities for um, building leaders and members of their PBIS teams to be able to actually visit kind of exemplar schools. And one thing that uh, was offered was a tier one walkthrough and buildings could volunteer and say, we'd like for you to, you know, people to come in and look at our processes and give us some feedback. And um, then at the tier two level, we offered what we called a fishbowl opportunity. And that was for an exemplar building who was implementing tier two well, to be able to hold a PBIS team meeting and have visitors and, and observers uh, kind of on the outside of the team watching that meeting and being able to ask questions and um, get their questions answered, but also watch a model. Then um, most recently, we have implemented a, a template for PBIS team meeting notes. And we know that um, our schools 
uh, understand the need for collecting and looking at the data and making decisions based on that. And we felt like this um, template allowed that process to be uh, streamlined. It also was one place where all of the resources are linked. And so when you, when, as a building leader, go in and um, plan your meeting, everything's there for you. It has your goals for the year listed. It has a place for you to reflect on the big five data. It um, reminds you of upcoming um, maybe survey timelines. And it also has links to all of the professional development. So it's a you know, one place that you can stay organized um, in a busy time and really um, talk about your data and get the help that you need based on what you see. Okay, so Leslie, I, I think one of the things that's really unique about the work you're doing in independence is that you've started to think about what policy pieces does data influence, but you're also thinking about the reverse of that in terms of what data pieces does policy influence. So you're building in the supports that you need to collect this data on an ongoing basis and to use this data in addition to just collecting it. So can you talk to us a little bit about how those pieces all come together for you? Okay, well, I think I would approach that um, in the, at the beginning level from when I was at uh, a building principal. And I, I knew how uh, we, how important database decisions were. That was obvious from the district guidance. And I knew how we were um, trying to um, analyze the data we had, but I didn't really have an opportunity often to be able to look at kind of where we fell within the district um, or how other people were approaching their work as a district team or how they were approaching using that data to make decisions in their building. So, and then I can take a look at it through my lens now at a district level and as a, a lead for the district PBIS team. And I can say that, um, Thankfully, for the, the support that we have from our local um, PBIS uh, support, uh, teams, um, we're really being able to be guided to ask some bigger questions about how that data is affecting um, district level policy. And um, I, I mean, I could give examples of from our comprehensive um, improvement plan at the district level and the language that we use, um, making sure that it is uh, in a, that PBIS is in alignment with that language, but also that um, the policies that we make at the district level that are also um, supporting what um, what we're doing with PBIS. You know, we look at what the school board has identified as their priorities, as well as um, all of the the ways that um, what we're doing at the building level supports our district improvement. And um, they, I mean, they obviously go hand in hand. And I'm, I'm really trying to look at from my role now how I can share more information um, with buildings and and their teams and their leaders about you know data from the entire district and we recently had um, quite a bit of discussion at a leadership retreat early in this year about our demographic data and um, in the disparities that we see in some places with some subgroups and um, so that not only was a discussion for us at a district level, but then taking that back as a, a building principle and being able to then also look at um, the demographic subgroup data at the building and having lots of conversations as, you know, as a local um, campus, as well as at the district level. And um, it, it, it just, very exciting to see how we've gotten to the point where we can dig even deeper and really make um, decisions that will um, affect all of our kids. And um, 
I'm looking forward to um, my uh, my role in learning even more about how we can do that because I know that's where we can uh, make the biggest impact for our kids. All right, next up, we'd like to welcome Danielle Starkey. And Danielle, if you would tell us a little bit about yourself and the work you do at Omaha Public Schools, we'd love to hear yeah. from you. Yes, thank you, Heather. My name is Danielle Starkey, and I am currently the MTSSB, or Multi-Tiered Systems of Support for Behavior Supervisor for Omaha Public Schools. I'm new to this role, so I started this role um, this past July. Prior to that, I worked at the MU Center for School-Wide Positive Behavior Support alongside Heather, and myself, along with um, a group of colleagues, did provide previous support to um, the supervisor before me here at Omaha Public Schools. So I had a little um, prior knowledge about the systems and how MTSSB worked within the district. So to give you a little background on Omaha Public Schools, we currently have 83 um, schools, elementary, middle, and high. And then within that, we also have 12 additional programs. So you can see the breakdowns on the slide in terms of number of elementaries, middles, and highs. We also have one K-12 virtual school um, we're also in the process of opening five new schools over the next couple of years. That ranges from um, elementary, middle, and then two new high schools that are opening next year. So total between all of our schools programs um, and up and coming schools, we're just a little bit over 100 total schools and programs in the district. Um, starting in fall of 2016, the district moved forward with a district-wide approach to MTSSB, our multi-tiered systems of support for behavior. So with a significant number of schools and programs, the district at the time strategically phased schools in to tier one implementation across three phases. Um, so that took over um, a year and a half of phasing those schools into the training for tier one. As of 2018, all schools and programs that currently exist in the district are implementing tier one of um, our MTSSB structures. As schools began to meet readiness for tier two, um, schools started training and support with tier two. Some of the readiness indicators that we looked at were tiered fidelity inventory scores, self-assessment survey scores. So did the staff feel like things were being implemented? We also looked at the percentage of students that were um, experiencing zero or one office referrals and looking at was the school consistently using tier one, big five data to make decisions. So definitely some concrete database decision making went into the process of when schools moved to tier two. As of this year, all schools in the district are at some phase of implementing tier two. We have a significant number of schools that are just getting started. So they're beginning to build tier two systems. And then we also have about half of our buildings that have been implementing tier two for at least a year, if not more. Um, so we kind of have a wide range of tier two implementation. Last fall, schools began implementing um, tier three. This is a smaller subset. We have seven schools across the district, primarily elementary buildings that are starting to build their tier three structures and supports. Within Omaha Public Schools, um, in our strategic plan of action, we have an ethic of care priority. And within that, it looks at making sure buildings are supporting um, student social and emotional learning. And so MTSSB is a critical piece of that strategic plan of action. And so it is an expectation that all schools and programs implement our multi-tiered systems of support for behavior. All right, so Danielle, Omaha Public Schools is a really large school district which means that there are lots of students and lots of data to be had. Um, and I know from being part of the work in Omaha Public Schools that you all went through a process of developing dashboards to help database decision making at both tier one and tier two. Can you give us a little bit of an overview of how that worked and the choices you made and why you did it the way you did? Um, so the great part about speaking about our dashboards is we have great dashboards set up. There was a lot of expertise and knowledge that went into it, and we have a really great information management system. Um, both of these dashboards became into existence prior to me, so I can't take credit for the dashboards, but I'm happy to share um, a little bit about the amazing dashboards that we have to enter and analyze behavior data. 
So the first we have um, a tier one data dashboard. It's just called our behavior dashboard. Um, within that, there are different lenses based on your access level. So individuals that work in a school building have access to their individual school dashboard. And then someone at the district level, like myself, is able to look at the data from a district lens as well. So in the data dashboard, our behavior dashboard, when you go to it, it's going to show you those typical five um, positive behavior interventions and supports or MTSSB graphics that we talk about. So you can easily quickly see for whatever date range you specify um, behavior events by problem behavior, location, time, students involved. You can see it by the grade levels. And so we're really able to provide um, pretty immediate access for school teams to be able to look at the data and make decisions. Part of our strategic plan of action is that um, every MTSSB tier one team is looking at this behavior dashboard data monthly during their school meetings and creating what we call a solution plan from that data. So they're looking at the data and thinking about how from a school-wide approach can we respond? What do we need to do to prevent future occurrences of our top problem behavior? What do we need to reteach from our um, behavior matrix? What do we need to do to increase positive specific feedback and recognition when students are displaying the replacement behaviors that we want to see? And then as a staff, how are we going to consistently respond if this problematic behavior um, continues to happen? So this data really gives teams um, the real time, quick access that they need to be able to look at behavior data for the school and then create a solution plan. At the district level, we are also able to log in and look across all schools and programs, what are some common behaviors that we see? Um, and so one of the things that we've really done this year is created a monthly MTSSB newsletter that goes to our building level coaches. So every building has a tier one coach that's kind of a conduit of information between district and school teams. And so we send them a monthly newsletter and one of the sections in that focuses on district wide data. So every month we select one of the top behavior events that we're seeing across the district and we provide some general strategies that teams might be find helpful to incorporate into their solution plans for their team. Um, so it takes a little of the workload off, although they have to personalize it to the building and just gives them some ideas or strategies. You know, we've got multiple buildings that are looking at the same common problem behavior. How can we at the district level provide support on that? So our tier one dashboard is really being used at the school and then the district level as well. So Danielle, I, I just want to ask a follow up question. It sounds like um, building, the, looking at the data and knowing that you needed the data led to building the dashboards and then having the dashboards informed policy, not necessarily discipline policy, but administrative kind of policy for your building administrators and for the people who are supporting them and the teams to move the work forward. Is that an accurate summary? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the data is really given um, a better lens on what are consistent things across the district, where do teams need support, where do admins need support, and how can we as a district really come together to look at discipline and behavior across the district from a different lens. Great. Thank you. We also have a tier two data dashboard. So this one is a newer dashboard as we've got more and more schools and now everyone um, either beginning or implementing tier two. This dashboard allows us to progress monitor, monitor tier two implementation data. Um, so one of the interventions that we train on across the district is check in, check out. Um, and if you're familiar with that intervention, you know that students have a daily progress report um, where they receive a percentage of points daily for meeting school-wide expectations. And so this dashboard just gave us, again, an internal, easy way using systems that we've already established in the district to be able to progress monitor that data over time. As we move forward with implementation, we will also be able to look again at that data from the district lens and look at the number of students participating in the different interventions across the district. And I hear you saying we built a dashboard. Can you tell me a little bit about who we is? And I ask because I know some of the background about who we is in Omaha. And I think it's important for people who are looking at 
ways to create data systems here from a variety of people who was involved and what roles they played in buildings or at the district level as these dashboards were created? Yeah, so that is um, a great question because it definitely was not me. Um, it was kind of a joint effort from what's the data that we need to be able to see? What's the data that we're already collecting? And how can we take that data and then visually represent it within these dashboards? So it was a partnership between MTSSB, which is housed in our Student and Community Services um, Department here at Omaha Public Schools, and our IMS, our Information Management Systems. And they really built the dashboard um, um, based on feedback of these are the things that we need teams to be able to see visually, this is what that would look like, and that department was really able to take it and then build the dashboards and, of course, send it back out for testing, um, and they're continually updating those as we get feedback from teams as well. So definitely um, MTSSB and Student and Community Services definitely had the vision of what data we needed teams to have easy access to, but then um, our information management system um, definitely built it with all the coding and the technology pieces. So Danielle, your, um, your data dashboards give you a lot of information about student behavior and how to action plan around student needs. We know from the research base, we know from doing PBIS for as long as we've been doing it, that classroom implementation is really a key piece of the puzzle. And we know that office disciplinary data doesn't always give us the information we need to know about what steps the teacher took or what systems are in place in a teacher's mm -hmm. classroom. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about how Omaha is approaching improving and increasing classroom implementation? Yeah, um, obviously across the field, um, no matter what district, state, where we are, focusing on classroom implementation is key. We know if, you know, if we want to reach those changes in student outcomes and sustainability of MTSSB or PBIS, we've really got to focus in on the classroom. So that's been a big focus over the years, but especially this year in terms of how do we collect that data to figure out, number one, how are we doing with classroom implementation? But most importantly, what supports do teachers need in the classroom? What are practices that um, across the building or across the district we are really great at? And where can we um, always work to improve implementation? So one of the things that we've done um, is kind of a two-step process in that we have a classroom observation walkthrough form that has some um, MTSSB practices on it. It really looks at does the teacher have clearly identified classroom rules that are aligned to the school-wide expectations? Is the teacher using that language when we're um, setting students up for success and providing pre-corrects? And then when we're responding to behavior, whether that's giving positive specific feedback or corrective feedback. Um, and so we've got a form that we use. It takes about 10 minutes in the classroom. And so we use it at two different levels. First, the building level. Um, I would say we've done it across multiple buildings in the district. We're trying to get to all and to get teams to be able to do it internally. But just a quick 10 minute snapshot of every classroom or the majority of classrooms in a building. How are we doing on some of these key MTSSB practices? It's not meant to be evaluative. Honestly, we don't even write teachers names down on the forms. We just collate it as a building um, so that then we can look at do we have our clearly stated classroom rules that are aligned to school expectations? As a building, are we using that language? As a building, are we, you know, close to that four to one positive to corrective ratio that we always hear um, in the literature and in presentations? And so we really are able to give the school teams a report talking about implementation of some of those MTSSB practices. That helps the school team think about, okay, as a team, what supports do we need to put in place to support staff? Maybe um, we don't all have clearly defined classroom rules aligned with school-wide expectations that are posted. How can we promote getting some new signage that really clearly articulates how to be safe in the classroom? Maybe it's how do we support teachers in using that language when we're interacting with kids? Or maybe it's increasing higher rates of positive specific feedback and giving strategies for how that looks or how that might work. So the building teams are using that data to drive their building 
professional development, but then we're also looking at it from a district lens. So across the district, what are the practices that we're all doing really well? And what are the practices that at district level MTSSB, MTSSB we need to support teams um, to be able to support their staff to move implementation forward? So it's really giving us um, a better lens of, okay, we've built all these really great school-wide practices and all buildings have tier one pieces in place. Now, what does that look like during instruction? Because we know that's where it's critical. Um, and how do we use some of this data to drive PD that makes sense? So often, um, historically, it's easy to get in a pattern of picking something that is related to PBIS and TSSB and presenting it at a staff meeting. But now it's, okay, let's look at our data and figure out what practice is important and we know it's critical for the research and maybe we need to improve on it as a building and then at the district level as well. So we're trying to be really strategic. We know um, across schools in the district, having time for professional development is really limited. And so when we do have it, how do we make sure that we're focusing in on those practices that teachers need the most support on? Wow, such great information from two remarkable districts doing the really heavy lifting work of making sure that their teachers and their administrators and all of their staff have the resources and the supports that they need to implement PBIS and get the best outcomes for everyone in the district. A couple of things that I wanted to note before we look at how this connects to policy. Like I said, these districts took very similar journeys in terms of starting with starting small and growing their program. And in that process, it allowed them to adjust as they learned lessons year to year about what kinds of data they might need to collect, how to use that data, how to tailor programs, etc. They also did a really nice job of developing evaluation questions and letting that then drive how they selected and how they selected the data they needed and particularly how they consolidated data into internal data platforms, particularly around office discipline referral data. The difference is you'll note that each district added measures in certain places because they were valued by the stakeholders. We also see that they have tools and practices for reporting that meet contextually specific needs. So the way that Omaha is reporting out information in the form of their monthly newsletter with tips on how to address a particular type of behavior, it, it works for their context, whereas something like annual reports and scorecards and conversations are what they're, uh, what in, independence is using. All really great stuff. And just to give you that as kind of a visual overview, thinking about the data that these schools are collecting, the practices that they are engaging in with that data, and the systems that they're using to maintain all of this is, as they work through a school year, and particularly as we've worked through a couple of really rough school years. I just wanted to kind of give you a summary view of what those look like. Now, what I would like to spend a little bit of time on, not terribly much because I know we're, we're always push, pressed for time and we want to be able to answer plenty of questions. I wanna look at the policy piece a little bit. So again, policy, when, when, when I think of policy, I very often jumped immediately to code of conduct policy. And what I know from work that I've done in districts all over the country at this point is that policy is comprehensive. You've got hiring policy. You've got evalu a policy for evaluating teachers. You've got policies for supporting new teachers, policies for supporting new administrators, et cetera, and so forth. So policy is a much more comprehensive concept in this, in this realm than just office discipline referral policy. So a couple of crossovers. One of the things that I heard both of our exemplars talk about is how important it is to use common language across the district. And that goes from the vision and mission, mission statement that's front and center to all of the publications and communications and presentations and face-to-face -face conversations that happen all the way across the district. So I think that's a really nice place where the evaluation piece, which is driven by the data, informs the policy piece by letting you build 
that vision and mission statement from where you are and from what you're looking to get to. Um, and then and I actually talked through all of my information that was on my next slide. So then the other piece is really that instructional approach. And you heard Leslie talk about working through merging the various data entry systems that they had for discipline really caused them to think intentionally about defining problem behaviors and deciding what consequences matched with which behaviors at the school level, at the district level, and how that all worked and how that flow chart works so that we are consistent. So once again, lots of crossover here. And if you start to get into evaluation and feel bogged down, remember that you are some of the work you're applying there gets to be part of your work on policy and vice versa. So you're you're doing you're moving a lot more forward than you might think with each of these items. With that, I think that is the conclusion of the content that we have for you today. We'll open the floor up for questions and, and I'll bring all of our presenters on screen so that we can answer them for you. All righty. So, <clears throat> Leslie, Danielle, again, thank you for joining us and for explaining the work that you're doing at your in your various districts with all of your buildings. Um, so some things that came in along the way. There was a question about what technology programs <laughs> in terms of data collection. So we know that there are lots of prepackaged software programs out there, and I know you all both ended up going the route of designing an internal system, but I think both of you also started with some external systems. So the, I think the question is kind of what are some pros and cons and which ones might you recommend somebody starting with? I can um, start with this and I'm going to again say we have really great information management system that deals with all the inner workings. So I'll give you um, the information that I know on my end as a user. We use Infinite Campus here in Omaha Public Schools for data entry. So that's where um, all of our behavior event information is logged at the building level. And then the data is visualized in that behavior dashboard in Tableau. So all of our graphics are created within the Tableau system that we use within our Microsoft 365 system. And I think that is an accurate description. And um, Heather, I think part of your question was some other um, platforms maybe outside of what we're using. And I don't have enough information about that. Uh, Danielle might, but um, I know that what we use is, we call it incident tracker, but it really is just an internal um, data entry um, form and we we have that talk to EduClimber. That's kind of where everything for um, our district goes, academics, behavior and everything. And um, then our other system that we use is Illuminate for academics and that talks to EduClimber too. So okay. um, so a question that I have for both of you that that we didn't really get to in the course of the interviews. Uh, and I, I kind of thought about it, hearing something over the course of the last couple of days, there was discussion about how you make decisions about what to keep and what to let go of. And I know that particularly in evaluation systems and evaluation plans, that's an, a fluid and ongoing thing. So can you talk a little bit about things that you changed in terms of what data you were collecting or how you collected it, what systems you were using, how you were reporting it and working with it? I don't know if that, I'm seeing Danielle think. <laughs> but just, were there, were there, let me, let me phrase it this way. Were there things that were being done before because we always did them this way? We, we collect this data because we collect this data and we report it in this way because that's what we've always done. Are there things that you've deliberately changed and how does, how does that kind of work easing people into that change? Well, I think, um... I can't necessarily speak to what data was collected previously in the district before I arrived. I think one of the things that we really look to within what data do we need to have and how do we use that data and keep that data is really thinking about when we think about 
MTSSB teams, PBIS tier one teams? What does the research say the data is that they need to be looking at? Do they currently have access? And then how do we get them that way, um, that data in a way that's usable? So often at the district level, we have a whole lot of data. Um, and it was really thinking about we're already capturing or they were already capturing at the time a lot of data about behavior events in a system, but it wasn't necessarily producing the data back out in graphic formats that are easy for teams to use. Um, and so on the data dashboard, for example, when you go to it for your building, it just automatically on the dashboard shows you um, behavior events by time of day, location, problem behavior, number of students involved, grade levels. And so you're able to think about using that to create a strategic plan. So for us, I think it's what data is necessary for teams to use to make decisions and how do we make sure that it's easily accessible on demand and people aren't having to spend a lot of time to get the data in a format that works, that it's just there for them in that format already. And then really trying to use that data to drive, okay, what's working that we're doing and how do we keep doing that to move that data forward? Sure. And then I think I would defer to Dr. Guffey. She has actually been on the um, district team longer than I have and probably has some information that I don't have. All right, come on out, Tricia. What do you know? Hello. <laughs> So one of the things that I would add um, with ISD or independence when they first started um, was a couple of things. Number one, they kind of did an audit to start with of those schools that were implementing of who was completing the self-assessment survey, as well as who was completing the TFI to help identify where our implementation was with even that to identify if teams were even collecting data to see where their implementation was going. So that was a starting point. The second thing that independence did is they looked at, at that point in time, how they were collecting office referrals, if they were collecting minors or majors, and what those terms were or those, those items were as far as um, behaviors that students were being referred to or referred for. And with that, did those items or those terms align to what was in board policy? And in addition to that, within that code of conduct, and then a third point of that is, are we currently collecting that data within that big five report so that it is aligned as far as terminology? Because what we found was that people were referring things uh, with different terms and it didn't necessarily pop up within that big five because it was coded as something different. And additionally, there's those pieces of if I'm writing in what that referral is, it may not necessarily align to what is in board policy. So the district also went through and did kind of a real deep dive as far as what is the terminology, what is the, um, what's in board policy, let's make sure that we're using the same language and then let's define specifically what that looks like in the building as far as majors and minors so we can um, our data is a little bit more clean and also ensuring that we're not opening ourselves up to some sort of litigation because we are writing students up who are missing instruction for things that aren't in that board policy as well and so those were some pieces that isd really started with in identifying those data pieces but then as they were also um, building their internal reports identifying this is to make sure that our data is clean and useful for school teams and the district teams to be able to drill out or drill down as necessary. Excellent. Um, so I'm also seeing now, thank you, Kelsey, for summarizing this theme. And I think this theme has kind of popped up in a couple of different sessions that I've been in over the last couple of days. You all are doing walkthroughs in classrooms and that's great and that's exciting and it's fun. and you both know how much I'm excited about walkthroughs in classrooms and more data to analyze in another area. I love it. Um, so the questions, of course, and I know you all have faced these questions yourself, starts with who does them, how long does it take, when do you do them, and how do you track the data from one year to the next? So... <laughs> All right, I'll start <laughs> and then Leslie can wrap it up. So um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how we're currently doing it, but what we're building capacity for. So right now at the district level, there's myself as MTSSB supervisor and we also have an MTSSB lead teacher. So there are two of us who full-time job is to focus on supporting buildings in the district doing MTSSB. But um, if you recall, we are getting close to 100 schools and programs. So that's um, a large number of schools to support, especially when we think about doing classroom observations. 
So on that form that's in the files, it takes about 10 minutes per classroom to collect the data. And the way we've been doing it right now is that myself and Holly, who's the lead teacher, are supporting buildings and helping them get um, classroom walkthroughs going. So often that looks like um, myself and Holly from the district will go to the building and we will help their MTSSB team do walkthroughs and train them on how to do it. So we try to get into as many classrooms in the building as we can. Usually for most of our elementaries, um, if two of us are going in, we can get it done in three hours. For our bigger middle school and high schools, it usually takes about a day. Um, but we go into every classroom 10 minutes, and then we collate the data in an Excel file and are able to provide a building summary report of implementation. As we're buildings doing this from our, as we're at buildings doing it from the district lens, we're always trying to train building level individuals, members of the MTSSB tier one team, so that moving forward, they can conduct classroom walkthroughs. Um, so we were trying to do them at the beginning of the year, quarter one, we did a significant number of schools in the district and then we're still doing more. We also are creating a short training video on how to conduct the walkthroughs, how to enter the data, and we're sending it out to all of our district level uh, or building level administrators. And so we're trying to build fluency across multiple people to be able to move the work forward, if that makes sense. But I would say this year, a lot of the legwork has landed at the district level in terms of training and supporting buildings to be able to keep it going as we move forward. But I'm interested to see what Leslie says, because she probably has another different way to look at it as well. Well, um, so I can say that it's been now a couple of years since we've done them, We, um, but I was in the building then and um, schools could volunteer if they felt like that they were, um, I know my building was at the point where we implemented for quite a while and felt like maybe we were missing a few things that we had you know, gotten away from. So we asked for a tier one walkthrough and um, we don't have anybody specifically um, focused on that at the district level. So a variety of um, district level administrators went. Um, we had some other building level administrators that would join in the walkthrough. And um, we did not hit every classroom. We kind of spread out and, and you know, saw lots of them, but I would say it was not as comprehensive as what um, Danielle's doing. And as well, the information was available to that building. I don't know, Dr. Guffey would have to talk to the, whether or not it was used at the district level at that time. Um, I think all buildings have access to the walkthrough form. And I know even in years when we didn't, uh, weren't a part of the district level walkthrough, we would do that at the building level and just do a, a building team walkthrough. Um, so, I would say that's an area of growth for us to get back to that and to be able to have our data usable to us um, for a year over year comparison. Um, as far as the, sorry, I was having a hard time turning on my camera and unmuting. I would say as far as the district level piece, when the district started off with those walkthroughs, they did it as a pilot. So they selected a few schools to start with. And in that process of that pilot, rather than say, these are the schools we're gonna go to, what they did is they reached out to those building level administrators and those team leads and said, who would be interested in participating in this process? So we can number one, collect some data to identify how we can better support, but also we can kind of test the tool and get your feedback as far as part of that process. So there was a data component with that, but it was very much of a, we're gonna open this up to volunteers to start with because we also don't wanna be invasive. And it appears this is something um, that's, that is a truly a walkthrough form for us to help guide decision-making and guide support and not something that is seen as a, we gotcha, or we're trying to look for something or things of that nature. We wanted it to be very, um, welcoming and something that people were able to participate in should they choose to. So it started there. Um, and then from there, it grew over time so that it became inclusive of all buildings and all schools. 
The other piece with that that I think um, is really cool that Independence has done is that they've taken that data that they talk about on a monthly basis at those um, at those meetings, um, but also in looking at data they collect the TFI, the SAS, the walkthrough data, and they put out a, a newsletter that goes out to all staff members in the district. And what they do is they take that data that they've collected identify maybe one or two key things that they want to focus on as far as that big five report and then really dig in and say here are some classroom practices that that um, you might look at doing to help with these pieces and so that's another way that independence has really used some of that walkthrough data the big five data kind of triangulate that together to identify need and then bringing that full circle then to how do we provide some additional support with that um, that because we know that PD uh, time is is slim during this time, subs are slim. Um, and so what are ways that we can provide some training or coaching or PD where we're not pulling people out of a classroom um, that need to be there? What are some other avenues? And so Independence has really looked at those pieces with the data that they have, what is the best way for us to get this information out and for it to be impactful? And so that's another component with that walkthrough piece of how that data is utilized um, to help that district team in action planning, but also then to take it a, a step further with um, training and coaching. Great, um, Danielle. Quick question for you, and if you don't, if you don't have the information to answer this, that's fine. I've got a follow up answer to it. So, you mentioned having a virtual school in Omaha. How do you do walkthroughs for classrooms in a virtual school? Okay, so that's a great question. Um, we haven't done it yet in the virtual school, but I'm going to speak to two things. One, our virtual school is primarily virtual, but it is a little bit of a hybrid. So students do report to in-person learning for half a day per week. So the majority of learning takes place in the virtual environment, but they do have a little bit of in-person learning as well in terms of the overall K-12 virtual school. Last year, um, prior to me officially joining Omaha Public Schools, several of the buildings did do walkthroughs when we were in remote instruction. Um, and they use the same form with a few modifications in terms of, if you look at our form, it talks about teachers walking around the classroom and actively supervising. So it was slightly modified, but they would just pop in to their Microsoft Teams and do the same things in terms of, are teacher using expectation language? Are they recognizing appropriate behavior in the virtual environment? So we haven't done it this year in that virtual school setting, but it has been done previously in the district in terms of there are several practices that still should be taking place in those instructional conversations, whether it's a Teams meeting or in person. Yeah, and just to follow up on what Danielle has said, we work with another school district here in Missouri that implemented classroom walkthrough observations as a regular part of their routines for building level administrators to provide coaching support and to inform professional development. And they went ahead and continued with that when everything went online for COVID. And ha having listened to their, their folks talk about it, they're saying some of the same things, which is you've got to kind of redefine what you're looking for because engagement in a virtual environment looks different than engagement in a physical environment. Um, you know, trying to try and figure out if somebody's being disruptive is a little tricky. You know, I, I would argue that I'm often disruptive in meetings because my cat jumps in the middle of it. So does that count or not? How, you know, how does that work out? But on the plus side, one of the things that they discovered is that they can get a lot more observations done because they're not physically traveling even room to room or building to building. They can just click from one classroom to the next in Zoom. Leslie, are you all doing any virtual observations at all? Um, we, are, we are not at this point. I think the only information we would have right now is the um, you know, the teacher observation work that we do and the classroom management piece we might be able to look at, but uh, we, we haven't started that, but that's an interesting idea. It is, it's, it's, it's interesting to play with. Um, so Danielle, another question for you, what pieces of data are available in your tier one dashboard? And I think you've covered some of that, but just kind of thinking through what are the categories of data that are in there and. Yeah, so, um... When a school pulls it up, they can look at behavior events by problematic behavior, by time, location, grade level, 
um, the number of students that are involved in the event. So if any of you are familiar with Swiss or school-wide information system, it's a lot of the same types of information. Um, you can also set date ranges. And then you're also, we're also able to look at our, what we call behavior resolution. So what was determined to be happening as a result, as as our implied consequence for that, whether it was a conference with a student and parent contact. So we can also track the number um, and what that is looking like on the response end um, within that dashboard. Great. Um, we had a question as well about, for both, and I think both of you could answer this, in terms of tier one implementation data, do you track it from year to year? How do you track it from year to year? And what do you do with that information if you track it? So prior to me, um, the previous supervisor has set up a really great Excel spreadsheet that has all of our buildings in it and TFI and SAS in terms of that level of implementation data. So we track it across years and if there's a decrease or an increase that kind of color codes and changes so it'll flag for us, oh hey, this building has decreased implementation per the TFI or per the self-assessment survey. And so we're able to just get a quick glance. Um, when you've got close to 100 schools and programs, it's hard to look at it individually sometimes. So we kind of put all of that data together. One thing we didn't necessarily talk about um, in the session content was we also have used that data at the district level to try to prioritize which schools need additional levels of support. Um, so looking at TFI, looking at SAS and saying, okay, these schools appear to be implementing pretty well. So given limited re district resources, um, we're definitely gonna give them a tier one level of support, whereas these other buildings appear to be struggling with implementation. So we kind of try to keep an eye on that. Um, and we also align it a lot with student outcomes as well. So in the, one of our spreadsheets, you know, we've got TFI, we've got SAS, but we've also got behavior events per student per day um, and some of the other, you know, in school suspension data, et cetera. So we can really look at, is our implementation getting us to the outcomes that we wanna see? And if not, what supports might that school need? Great, and Leslie? Um, so I, I think we use the same sort of system. We take the information from the PBIS surveys and uh, put that in, you know, Google Sheets and we can keep that. What I liked was we, I don't, we do keep information on number of um, suspensions and those sorts of things, but they're not in the same place. So I like that idea of having all of that information together because it really tells a whole picture. So that's something that I would think about. Absolutely. And Danielle, there was a, an extension question on that. Can, you, can your users in your dashboard drill down in the data? Yes, so in our, um, dashboard, for example, on the graphic that talks about behaviors um, by location. I can click on a specific location and all the data graphs are going to filter to time that's happening in that specific location or problem behavior that's happening in that specific location. I can reset my filters and then say, okay, classroom disruption or behavior disruptive to the learning environment is number one. Let's click on that. And then all of the other graphics filter down to show me when is that exact problem behavior happening with what grade levels and where is it happening? Um, so we do have, again, that really great dashboard that does allow us to dig deeper just by a click on a graph. Excellent. Um, question came in, could building administrators collect the same data used in the, used in the walkthrough when doing individual classroom observations for evaluation and feedback? And I see you both are already, already nodding your heads at me. That yes, that is possible. Um, absolutely. And in fact, the other district that we're working with that I was speaking about earlier, it is entirely their administrators who are doing those walkthroughs. That said, you can, you can approach walkthrough, classroom walkthroughs from a lot of perspectives. So you can use administrators. You can use uh, partner teachers. As much as, and we all kind of discovered this today, as much, as much as it's painful to listen to your own voice on a recording, you can do a lot of that information. You can get a lot of that information for yourself. Uh, Heather, to get back to it, I think it's what's the intended outcome. So definitely administrators and many of our buildings do use some of those same data pieces in their administrative walkthroughs. When we've been doing them most recently at a building level, 
um, when we're going into as many classrooms as we can, there have been the majority of instances where we don't even necessarily at this level as we're just really delving into it, write down teachers' names on the forms. It's as a building, how are we doing with implementing these practices? Because um, if you're in the last session, you heard me say it, we can't expect teachers to implement practices if we don't have systems to support them. And often what we see is especially for buildings that are newer to this work is you quickly see patterns across classrooms in a building. A lot of teachers in a building might be struggling with one practice. And so then it's not intended to be evaluative. It's intended for the MTSSB team to then say, hey, how do we support our teachers as a whole in being able to do that versus giving a teacher individual data and talking through it. So there are so many different ways to use the same walkthrough form. And I think it's what is your outcome with the data um, in this instance. And I know that we, uh, when we were expecting to have district level people in for our walkthrough, we practiced first ourselves. And we actually, there was a much bigger payoff from teachers doing the walkthrough with in their neighbor's classrooms because um, it was quick, it was um, non-evaluative because they're looking at each other and, um, and they really got a chance to see model classrooms or, um, or the opposite, classrooms where it wasn't really implemented well. And um, we appreciated the information we got from the district level walkthrough, but I think we got more out of the teachers doing the walkthrough. And of course, those are two different reasons to be doing it, so. All right, well, we're winding up down on time. I just want to ask one final question to both of you. And I just want, I know that even for those of us who are veteran implementers, veteran researchers, people who work with data all day, every day, there are days when the evaluation piece of the DSFI and the policy piece of the DSFI look incredibly daunting. What motivates you to keep doing that work? I think at the end of the day, when we think about overarching MTSSB, PBIS data and using database decision making is one of those critical pieces that's going to lead to the outcomes and the way we're going to know if we're reaching our outcomes. So the data piece is often um, can be overwhelming and there's a lot there and it takes a lot of different departments often to make it work but making sure that school teams and at the district level, we have access and easy access to the data that we need to be able to make decisions and provide the right supports at the right time to the right people, whether it be buildings, teachers, students, um, is really critical to making all of our efforts effective. Um, you know, sometimes I feel like we come up with all these great ideas, but does the data indicate that there's a need for that? Or does the data indicate that these things are working? And at the end of the day, having things written into policy is going to help us ensure that they get done and that we're able to continue the work moving forward, that sustainability piece. So I think that these two are definitely two of the harder pieces of the district level work, but they're really the ones that are going to promote sustainability and help us be able to show that all the time, energy, and effort we're putting in are actually successful for students and staff. And I, the only thing I would add to that is uh, you asked, you know, what, what spurs us on when it gets difficult. And I would say that's the support that we have from Dr. Guffey and our, um, our PDC um, support staff, because we find ourselves uh, being pretty critical when, when we're trying to look at those standards and rate ourselves. And um, it's just nice to have um, an outside voice, but somebody who's part of the group um, be able to, you know, talk you through what it's really asking, being, giving yourself credit for the things that you're doing and coaching you on the next steps that um, you need to take in order to get you where, um, where we want to be. So I, I think it's the vision piece and it's also just realistically the extra support that we can get to do that work. Great. Thank you so much, both of you, for all of the time that you've spent with us and the wisdom and tools that you've shared. I'm going to post the evaluation information for this session. And that is all of the content that we have for now. Thank you so much.